Okay, so I was watching, this just popped up. I've never heard of this uh, group before, Examining Adventism. I don't know who this speaker is. It just popped up and I listened to it and I said, there is so much error in this. I just want to respond to it. So I'm going to listen to it and I'm going to respond to it. This is Examining Adventism. And if you really want um, to get answers from an Adventist source that does, at least from the videos I've seen, I can't speak on all the videos because there's so many and I can't speak on all of them, but I've seen a good portion of videos from the Advent Defense League and they have done a wonderful job from, well, I I've seen, I would say a small portion, but from what I've seen compared to all that they've done, the, the portions that I've seen have been very well done from uh, Advent Defense League. And every now and then I will send uh, um, uh, Edwin Cotto a, a video or something that I think, but I know they've got their plate full. But I saw this from Examining Adventism, and I just wanted to respond to this. So I'm going to play this, and I'm going to stop here and there and respond. So this is uh, called Doug Batchelor's False Teaching Exposed from Examining Adventism. It's because if the com Ten Commandments aren't important and the Fourth Commandment being a part of the Ten Commandments is no longer valid, then why does it talk about the commandments in Revelation about keeping the commandments? Friends, one of the identifying characteristics of God's people, we know that during the Dark Ages that the church slipped far away from Scripture and the Reformation was to bring people back to Biblical Christianity. And I believe the whole world is going to be polarized into one of two groups in the last days. One group is going to have the mark of the beast. The other group is going to have the seal of God. I'm actually talking a little bit about that tomorrow in the Armageddon message. But it tells us that the seal of God is really the law of God written in our hearts. Did you catch that? So Doug's claim is that the seal of God is the law of God written in our hearts. So in this video, you're going to see how this seemingly subtle twist of what the seal of God is actually gives Adventism a false and fatal gospel. And he just said that there will be two groups of people in the last days. One group is going to have the mark of the beast. So this is the Adventist three angels message is what he's referring to. Those who don't keep the Sabbath, or another way of stating it is all people who attend church on Sunday will receive the mark of the beast and go to hell. And the other group are those who keep the... Uh, just very quickly, I have a series on Is Hell Real? So if you want to look at the biblical understanding of the fiery judgment of God. That's another series on that. So we don't, just very quickly, we don't believe in um, an eternal destruction, or no, the destruction is eternal, but we don't believe in an eternal, endless suffering of the soul in hell as in some underworld or some other dimension. But the Bible is very clear that there's a fiery judgment from God. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9 and 10 uh, give us a, a glimpse of that fiery judgment. There's a fiery judgment from God, the and it happens on the surface of this earth. If you look at the context of Revelation 20, it happens on the surface of this earth. And then in Revelation chapter 21, we see there's a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, there's going to be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor any more pain. All of those things will have passed away, we see in verse 4. And so clearly, if that fiery destruction happens on the surface of the, this, this earth, and then there's no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, as we read in Revelation 21, then clearly um, there's not going to be this endless suffering on the surface of this earth, which is that final judgment, um, it's not going to go on and on endlessly, but the destruction is going to be eternal. They're going to be wiped out. So that's another story. But again, I have that presentation on that is hell real. But uh, let's continue with this. The commandments of God, by Doug's interpretation, that's the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, right? So for today, we're going to show you just how clear it is in Scripture what the seal of God is and that it's not the law of God written on our hearts, the Sabbath. And therefore, the mark of the beast is not worshiping on Sunday. There is Now, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, honestly, and I'm speaking 
as I watched this, I said, I know he's going to go to Ephesians 1.13 and Ephesians 4.30. I knew he was going to go to that. And let's continue. No place in the Bible that claims that the law of God on our hearts is the seal of God. So what does the Bible actually say about the seal of God? Let's turn to Ephesians 1.13 because this verse alone really puts this argument to rest and you're going to see just how clear it is. So it says, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, so what is the message of truth? He says it right here, the gospel of your salvation. Having also, watch this, believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So as you can see, this verse very plainly states that when a person believes the gospel, which is putting their faith in Christ alone for salvation, then they receive the Holy Spirit, who is God himself. And notice how Doug mentioned nothing about believing in Jesus as the... Now, I'm not sure how much he listens to Doug, but Doug is all about believing Jesus. And he's also going to mention Ephesians 4.30. I'm going to be reading from the King James here in my Bible. So um, in Ephesians 1.13, it says, In him you, all, uh, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having uh, believed, you were sealed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, now... You probably are familiar with some of those medieval images, or even in today's world. You can, you know, maybe a signet ring, a signet ring that would have the seal, and then it was used to seal uh, a scroll or a letter. So you have the seal on the ring, right? And then you have what's left as a result of the seal, okay? So... Having the Holy Spirit, Jesus made it clear, and you can look in the Holy Spirit passages. I don't want this video to be too long. You can do your homework. Uh, John 14, 16 to 18, verse 26, John 15, 26, and John 16, 7 through 11, and 13 to 15. And when you read, it makes it clear that the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. If you have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. Is there anything contradictory about saying, well, the Holy Spirit, as it says here in the New King James uh, Version, it says, um, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. If you have the Holy Spirit, is there going to be evidence in your life? Well, according to Romans chapter Eight, if you look in Romans chapter 8, well, let's go back to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 verse 14 tells us, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So what is the law? The law is spiritual. Okay, if we look in Romans chapter 3 and verse 31, it says, By faith do we make the law of God void? No, on the contrary, we establish the law of God. Right? I'm paraphrasing, but I want to be quick with this video. So you establish the law of God. Uh, it, you don't make the law of God void by faith. So now, if we go to Romans chapter 8, uh, the high point in Romans, Romans chapter 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay, this is Romans chapter 8. Okay, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And it goes on to say, those who live according to the flesh have their minds on the things of the flesh, and those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And then it says, for to be carnally minded is death, in verse 6, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And in verse 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to his law, 
nor indeed can be. So if you're in the flesh, you are not in Christ, you are not in the Spirit, so you cannot keep the law if you have not surrendered your heart to Christ. But if you are in the Spirit, the righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled in you. So let's look at it again. According to verse 7 of Romans chapter 8, if the carnal mind, if you're in the flesh, um, y y the carnal t mind is an enmity against God. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the carnal mind is not subject to the law, nor indeed can be. So the carnal mind, if you're in the flesh, if you have not accepted Christ, then you're not under grace. Then you're not surrendered. It's not a matter of works. It's not a matter of the flesh. It's a matter of surrendering to the Spirit because Christ was tempted on all points, yet without sin, according to Hebrews 4.15. So if Christ is tempted on all points, yet without sin, and now Christ is in me, I can have victory over sin, and I can keep the law. And not in my own strength, but Christ in me, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. So to say, well, the Holy Spirit is the seal, the Holy Spirit brings Christ in you, and Christ enables you to keep the law, not in your strength, not by your might. It's Christ that you're surrendering to his character. Did Christ keep the law? Yes, he did. So there's not a contradiction, and I knew he'd go to that verse. There is no contradiction in saying that the Holy Spirit is the seal of God, or how it's, I want to read it here. Uh, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. If you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, you're going to keep the law just like it says in the book of Revelation 14, 12. We'll continue. Way to receive the seal of God. This is because they have a false gospel. And so we know we should... So, you know, it's interesting to me. A lot of these Christians will be the first to cry out against the LGBT against homosexuality, against abortion. A lot of them will, but at the same time, they're undermining the law of God, so they're destroying their basis for speaking against these things. It's true. It's true. We, we have to love all people. We have to love the homosexual. We have to love the sinner, but we are to call sin by its rightful name. We are to do that, yes. Jesus made clear, according to the book of Luke 17, 26 to 30, the end times, the, the days when the Son of Man is revealed, are going to be like the days of Lot. They're going to be like the days of Noah. And so we have to call sin by its rightful name. But when you're undermining the law of God, <laughs> you have destroyed your whole basis for doing that. Let's continue. You should have at least two verses to prove a doctrine. So let's turn to Ephesians 4.30, where it says, I do, see? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were, watch this, sealed for the day of redemption. So, like I mentioned, and it's just a crude illustration, but you have the seal, you have the signet ring, right? You have the stamp itself, and then you have what it remains, what remains. If you have received the Holy Spirit, if you've received the character of Christ, what is going to remain? What was the character of Christ? Christ had a lawful character, and so that character is going to remain. It's going to be revealed in the lives of believers. This is not a contradiction in saying, yes, the Holy Spirit is the one who seals you. And that is revealed, of course. The gospel, the everlasting gospel, that's revealed in Revelation 14, uh, 6 and 7 in the first angel's message, it is a gospel of victory. It's not a gospel of defeat. So when it, once again we look in Hebrews, uh, not Hebrews, Ephesians 4 and verse 30, uh, we see, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed, and you're sealed with the character of Christ. And so as you surrender to that character, you go from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So it's not a contradiction there. The work of the Holy Spirit in your life produces the character of Christ. And as you surrender to that character, you keep the law of God. So it says we were sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. So it's saying the Holy Spirit is the guarantor 
of eternal redemption in Christ for those who believe in him. And, and Christ is not saving us unto lawlessness. Get that? Christ is not saving us to be lawless. So, as you can see, this is totally contrary to what Doug was saying, that the law of God written on our... It's not contrary. I just explained why. If you receive the Holy Spirit, you're receiving the character of Christ. Christ kept the law. You're gonna... You're, if you marry someone and you love that person, are you going to want to violate the terms of the marriage and want to go going to go outside of it? It's a good illustration that we see in the book of Numbers chapter 15. Go to Numbers chapter 15, start verse 37, and you'll see that the Israelites would wear those tassels with that blue cord in them. So they'd be walking within those tassels, which was signifying when they looked upon that blue cord, it was signifying the commandments of God and that they would walk within the boundaries of the law of God because the law of God is a law of love. We're going to get to that. Our hearts is just like a marriage, right? Just like a marriage. You know, you walk with it. If you love someone, you stay within the boundaries of the marriage. It's the seal of God. And we're going to talk more about the law in a bit, but what it's saying here in these two verses is that once a person puts their faith in Christ alone for salvation, the sealing of which Paul refers to is an official mark of identification placed on a letter, a contract. Right, and how were those things placed on letters and contracts, especially in the ancient world? There was a ring, right? So you had the mark on the ring and then it would leave, it would leave its imprint on the wax, on the hot wax to seal the letter. And so, um, so you have the, the source of the mark. You have the source of the seal. You have what's left behind. The Holy Spirit brings Christ. And what Christ does in a person's life, the mark of his character, is seen in the lawful living of the person who has received the character of Christ, who kept the law. Or other document. So that document was thereby officially under the authority of the person whose stamp was on the seal. So the Holy Spirit is given by God as his pledge of believers' future inheritance. Again... Now, uh, well, I don't want to jump the gun, but I might forget later. The Sabbath is the only command that says remember. Isn't it interesting? You'll see later that that's the one that's going to be under attack. Now, now the Bible is talking about the law. Well, the law includes the Sabbath. It's the only one that says remember. It's the only one that says remember. That's the one that's under attack. Um, well, let's continue. The seal is not the law of God. Saying that the seal is the law of God totally distorts and changes the gospel. Okay, it doesn't distort and change anything to say that the Holy Spirit, as we see in Ephesians 4 and verse 30, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, the Holy Spirit brings Christ's lawful character in your life, you're going to want to keep the law because you love God. As it says in 1 John 5, 2 and 3, it's not going to be a burden to you. Okay, that's the love of God. It's not going to be a burden to you just like it won't be a burden to you to spend time with your wife on a date. To, 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 to be faithful. It's not going to be a burden because you love her. It's not going to be a burden for you to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to set this time aside, a tabernacle in time, the Sabbath, for me to just spend time with the Lord and rest and to turn my mind away from the things of the world. That's not a burden. That's not legalism. That's joy. You want to have rest and meditate in the Bible and the Word of God rather than working your life away? And that's legalism? So let's see what scripture says about the law of God and its purpose. Scripture actually calls the law a curse because it only brought condemnation because no one... Okay, now hold on a minute. He went to Galatians 3.10. And so Galatians 3.10 is basically saying, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, as it is written... Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things written in the book of the law to do them. When, what is going on here? Basically, can we keep the law in our own strength? 
we'll go back in the Old Testament. Aaron failed, right? He worshipped a, uh, he built a, a golden calf. His sons, Nadab and Abihu, in the book of Leviticus chapter 10, offered strange fire, right? So uh, what is revealed when we look in the Old Testament? Uh, Moses made a big mistake, right? When he struck the rock and he wasn't able to go into the promised land. Did David sin? Yeah, David committed a terrible sin, took his, his friend Uriah's, uh, sent him into battle, got him killed, and took his wife. So what is revealed? When we look at the Old Testament, we see that in our flesh, what about Abraham? Abraham, right? Telling the Abimelech, telling the Pharaoh that this is my sister, not telling him the whole story, and uh, telling a bit of a half-truth. Half uh, well, that was a deception in its own way. Um, was Abraham perfect? Somebody might want to argue with me and say, oh, no, he was telling the truth. Well, he was telling part of the truth, but obviously he didn't tell the part that the Pharaoh and the Abimelech would have wanted to know. Now, I've, at now, but Abraham was obviously somebody that the Bible says in book of Genesis uh, 26 and verse number, uh, let's see, number five, it says, but because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. How was he counted as having done that when he made the mistakes that he made? Because he trusted in God. He believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Yes, he made mistakes. Yes, Job made mistakes. Yes, Isaac made mistakes. Yes, Judah made mistakes. Yes, we see David made mistakes. Who didn't make mistakes? Who didn't have problems? Jonah running from the Lord because he didn't want to do his mission. What do we see? We see they were always saved by grace, right? They were always saved by grace. But does that mean that the law can't be kept? Not in our own strength. Not in our own strength. But as a person goes from glory to glory, as we see in 2 Corinthians 3.18, that lawful character grows in them. The thief on the cross, he didn't even have time to get baptized. And yet he was justified by faith in Christ. Had he got off the cross and had he been able to live, he would have gone from glory to glory too. That character of Christ, just like we see in Galatians, in Galatians 4.19. Let's take a quick jump over there. Uh, Galatians 4.19, and here we see, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. So we go from glory to glory. We grow in Christ. And yet, we are counted as if we had never sinned if we surrender to Christ. All the sins of the past, if we surrender those sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us as we see. Uh, so you're going to go from glory to glory. It's not cheap grace where you say, okay, I can sin and do whatever I want because I'm going to be counted as righteous. If you have that attitude, then you haven't surrendered. But if you surrender, you're going to grow. You're going to go from glory to glory. That's the process of sanctification. Okay, so we have 1 John 4, and 1 John 4 and verse number uh, 13, we read, uh, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. So we are in him, that's justification. We're justified by Christ, but him in us, that's the character of Christ forming in you. That's Galatians 4.19. That's going from glory to glory. It's a process. You're going step by step. Uh, it's not contrary to the sealing work of the Holy Spirit for a person to go from glory to glory, to, to learn to love the Lord and to learn to love his law and to move in the right direction for the character to be changed, to have victory over sin. Yes, you can. It's just a matter of surrender. It's not a matter of works. It's the opposite of works. It's surrendering to the work that has been done in Christ. To keep it perfectly, Scripture explains that the law has no saving power. And here's a little chart for you about what the law does. Okay, so he got a chart up here, and in the chart he's got Galatians 3.10, where he says, uh, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, as it is written, curse is everyone who does not continue in all the things written in the book of the law to do them. Paul basically is dealing with those who are not putting their trust in Christ. And if you're not putting your trust in Christ... 
you're putting it in the flesh. You're putting it in the flesh. And one of the key things that shows us that Paul really is dealing with the ceremony, ceremonial aspects of the law in Galatians. He's dealing with those shadows. He's dealing with the shadows, the ceremonial aspects of the law, the fleshy ordinances. If you read in the book of Hebrews chapter uh, 10 and verse 1, it says the law has a shadow. And it goes on to talk about the sacrifices. In Hebrews 9, 9 and 10, we read about those carnal ordinances and diverse washings and foods and things like that. That's all in the context of the ceremonial shadows. There are shadows, just like the word is used in Hebrews 10, 1. Okay, so... And now when we look in Hebrews chapter 5, or rather not Hebrews chapter 5, but in Galatians, in Galatians uh, chapter 5, we can see in right from the beginning of Galatians chapter 5, Paul was really dealing with those that were trying to draw the Galatians back into the shadow aspects of the law in particular, because here we see in uh, the fleshy ordinances focus of circumcision in Galatians chapter 5. And here we see, uh, Stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has uh, made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if any uh, that if you become circumcised, 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 Christ will profit you nothing. So he's specifically dealing with those, going back to those fleshy ordinances, you use the language of Hebrews 9, 9 and 10. Okay, that's specifically the aspect of the law, the shadows. And that also relates to what we see in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, where we're talking about the shadow Sabbaths. Um, and that's another story, but let's continue here. So, so he says the law is our guardian. And here he's referring to Galatians 3.23. Um, before uh, faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward uh, be revealed. And then we go on there and see in verse number 24, uh, for the law uh, served as a tutor to bring us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. Yeah, the, these, um, the law does ultimately point us to Christ. In one sense, whether we're talking about the shadow aspects of the law, that points us to Christ. Whether you're talking about the sacrifices and the ceremonial laws and all that, ultimately Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. The earthly tabernacle and all the things surrounding it ultimately pointed to the ultimate sacrifice of Christ, who is our great high priest, as we see in Hebrews chapter 8, starting in verse 1. In Hebrews 4, 14, and 15, Jesus is our great high priest in the heavenly tabernacle, in the heavenly sanctuary. So in that sense, but the law itself also points us to Christ because when we look at the law, uh, whether we're talking about the Ten Commandments, I mean the moral aspect of the law, that shows us our need for Christ. We can't keep that in our own strength. Let's continue here. And um, Galatians uh, 3, 24. Uh, yeah, Galatians 3, 24. Okay. Um, Galatians 3, 23, 3, 24. Let's continue here. So it was based on works. He acted like a guardian and a two. Now, again, he's, he says it's based on works and he goes back to Galatians 3, 10. Okay. And he says, for as many as are of the works of the law. Again, I'm going to read it. Just uh, this is uh, Galatians 3. And verse 10, I'm reading a New King James, for as, uh, New King James, for as many as are of the works of the law, of the works. In other words, they're putting their trust in the works of the law. No, the works of the law, the law shows us we need Christ. And he's correct. The law can't save you. Adventists don't believe the law can save you. It points us to our need for Christ. Okay, but those who are of the works of the law, those who are rejecting grace, those who are rejecting that Christ is the fulfillment of those ceremonial shadow Sabbaths and all those ceremonial laws and that, and that Christ is the one who truly kept the law and that Christ is the fulfillment of the law, those who believe that and who accept Christ are not going to go back to those ceremonial Sabbaths. They're not going to trust in their flesh. They're going to be in the spirit. And like I said, 714, the law is spiritual, 714 of Romans, and the righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh. They're no longer going to be according, they're not going to live according to the flesh, they're going to be in the spirit, Romans 8 and verse 4. Let's continue here. 
The works of the law put us under a curse since no The works of the law put us under a curse. If we are in the flesh, you are under the law. That goes to Romans 6.14, where it says, Sin shall no longer have dominion over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. And again, if we go to Romans chapter 3, if we look at Romans chapter 3, uh, verse number 9 and 19, uh, for we have previously charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And it basically points out that um, by the law, everybody is guilty. Everybody is guilty. So by nature, we're all under the law. By nature, we have a sinful nature. We, are, we have a fleshy nature. We're carnal by nature. Okay. So when we look at Romans 3 and verse 9 and verse 19, by nature, we're all under the law. Being under the law is under sin. Being in the flesh, trusting in the flesh, that's what the Pharisees were doing. And that's what these people who were deceiving the Galatian Christians were doing. They were, t they were drawing them away from trust in Christ. And so, so that when you draw away from Christ, you're not under grace, you're under sin. That's what it is to be under the law because you're putting your trust in your flesh. No matter how many good works a person does, they'll never measure up to God's perfect standard, which is only found in Jesus. It keeps us for faith later to be revealed and brings us to Christ. Why the law then? In other words, he's saying, what was the purpose of the law? And he goes on to say it was added because of transgressions. So he's saying the law was added to act like a mirror and show us how sinful we are, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. So very important to understand. Now, very important to understand that the seed is Christ, as pointed out in verse number 16. It says, uh, now, to, now to Abraham, wait, how does it say that now? Uh, Galatians 3 and verse 16. Um, see, I'm try I, I memorized this, and I don't want to mess it up. But um, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. It does not say, and to uh, and to his seeds as of many, but as of one, and to his seed which is Christ. So it's so the seed is Christ. But then why does it say um, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made? Well, was the promise made to Christ? Well, the seed is also those who are in Christ, as we see later on, and it says. For you, in verse number 26 of Galatians, for you are sons of God through Christ Jesus, through Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so there is neither Greek nor Jew, bond nor free woman, man, but all are one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So on the one hand, the seed is Christ, but on the other hand, if you are in Christ, you are the seed. So when it says to whom the promise had been made, the promise is made to those of faith. And those of faith were always the seed. They were always in Christ, whether in the Old Testament, even though Christ did not come in the flesh, the faithful of the Old Testament were the seed awaiting for Christ. They were the seed whose faith looked forward. If we look in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the, those who were of faith in the Old Testament were saved by Christ. Even though their faith pointed forward to Christ, they were the seed. They were those. Now, we might say, well, how can Abraham be the seed. What about Noah? Wasn't he, how could Noah be Abraham's seed? Well, Abraham is a type. He's a, he's a, a representation of faith, right? As we see in Romans chapter four, okay? So if we say, well, Noah was before Abraham, how could he be uh, considered the seed? How could he be considered the seed? In what sense? Well, 
Noah's faith also pointed forward to Christ. Abel's faith pointed forward to Christ. So ultimately, anybody who was of faith, okay, is the seed. And so, like I said, on the one hand, the seed is Christ. But Christ died to save people, and salvation was always through Christ, even before he was incarnated. So those shadow sacrifices of the Old Testament, the blood of the lamb on Passover put on the doorposts, applied horizontally and vertically, reminds us of the cross. Um, the, the horns on the altar of burnt offering. You got those horns on that altar of burnt offering, and the blood was applied with the sin offering. And what does that remind us? Of Christ on the cross. He had a crown of thorns. He had a nail in one hand, a nail in the other, nail through the feet. Salvation was always through Christ. When Noah offered those sacrifices, that was pointing to Christ. When Cain, or, or Abel, rather, offered his, always pointing to Christ. Salvation was always through Christ. Understand this. Until the seed would come, that's Jesus. So he's saying that the law would be in effect until Jesus comes. Next verse, verse 20. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. So here, Paul's point is that a mediator is required when more than one party is involved. But God alone ratified the covenant with Abraham, thereby showing that it was a unilateral covenant. And we remember Genesis 15, 6, where it says that Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. Okay, so Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. Whose righteousness? How was it counted to him as righteousness? Because Abraham's faith pointed forward to Christ. His faith pointed forward to Christ. Let's continue. But Abraham also was counted as having kept the laws. We saw in 26 verse 5 of Genesis. Okay, Abraham was also counted, even though he wasn't perfect. You know, think about the situation with Abimelech. Think about, think about it with the Pharaoh. He wasn't perfect. Isaac wasn't perfect. They all made mistakes, but they were on a journey of faith, going from glory to glory. Okay, and God's people are. And as they grow in their walk with the Lord, the character of Christ becomes more evident in their lives. Christ is formed in us, Christ in us, Colossians 2, 20, uh, 1, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory, us in Christ, Christ in us. 1 John 4, 13, Christ is our righteousness, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. That's righteousness by faith alone. That's the Abrahamic covenant, and that's the covenant that we've been grafted into, according to Romans 11. Um, yes, and he's bringing up Romans 11. So we become part of Israel. We become part of Israel. We become part of God's commandment keeping people of all time. Praise the Lord for that. Like the Mosaic Covenant, which contained the Sabbath and was a bilateral covenant that Israel couldn't abide to. And scripture... Okay, again, as I pointed out, as I pointed out, there were those of faith throughout the Bible. Just look in Hebrews 11 for that faith hall of fame. There were those who entered that rest. When we read about Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Too much to study right now, but that rest is basically talking about trust in Christ. And there's a and it mentions in Hebrews 4, 1, I believe Hebrews 4, 1, uh, 3, 6, and 9. I might be jumping the gun there, but it repeatedly mentions the, uh, the arrest remaining. And um, so, well, let me turn there. Hebrews 4. I didn't want this video to be too long, but in, in Hebrews 4, it says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering the rest. It means it remains. It means it was there before. We can't say that everyone in the Old Testament was faithless. We know that's not true. So there were those that entered that rest, but that doesn't mean that they didn't keep the Sabbath. Those who entered into the, those who were in the faith hall of fame in Romans chapter 11, they still kept the Sabbath. So trusting in Christ, trusting in God doesn't mean I don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore. It's still a commandment of God. It's still one of the ten. 
So it's interesting how uh, when people speak about this, they ultimately just are narrowing it down to one law. So they're basically saying, well, we keep nine commandments. We don't say you could uh, you could worship other gods. We don't say you could take uh, you worship idols. We don't say you could take the name of God in vain. It's only the Sabbath. That's the only one we say doesn't matter anymore. We don't say it's okay to dishonor your father and mother, or it's okay to murder, or it's okay to commit adultery, or it's okay to steal, or it's okay to uh, bear false witness, or it's okay to cover none of those it's just the one that says remember so it's interesting how it always works out that way very clearly explains that since the israelites did not abide to the mosaic covenant which was a bilateral covenant that means it's now nullified since they didn't live up to their end of the agreement next verse verse 21 okay when you talk about holding up their end of the bargain it makes it as though they did it by their own strength. It was never by their own strength. David was saved by the grace of God, just as was Noah, just as was Moses, just as was Aaron. They made mistakes, but it was always by God's grace. Okay, so when Abraham is said to have kept God's commandments, decrees, and laws in Genesis 26 and verse 5, it was by God's grace that he was counted that way. When it says in Matthew, be perfect, it's by God's grace. Now you go from glory to glory, and the character of Christ is growing in you from glory to glory. The image of Christ is forming you as you surrender, as you learn to surrender. It is a process, but it is not contrary to keeping the law of God. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. Strongest negative in the Greek. So he So again, the law is not contrary to the promise. As we look there in Galatians 3.21, what shall we say then? Is the law against the promise? Certainly not. For had there been a law given that could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. So in other words, if righteousness could have ever been by the law, if it could have been by keeping the law in your own flesh, then there would be two means of salvation, and that would have been contrary. And many Christians do believe that. There are those who believe, well, in the Old Testament, they were saved by the law. In the New Testament, they were saved by grace. No, as I mentioned, in just a few examples, we could see that they were never saved by keeping the law in their own strength. It was always by the grace of God, by faith. It was always, as it says in Romans 5, 1, therefore we are justified by faith and have peace with God through Jesus Christ. It was always that way. So when it says here that it makes it clear that the law could not give life, it never could give life. Salvation was never through the law, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament, but it is not contrary to so we don't have two means of salvation. There's only one. It was always by grace through faith. It was always through Christ. But it is not contrary. It is not contrary. That means it is not against the promise of God. So keeping the law, having the character of Christ who was lawful in your life and keeping the law is not against the gospel. It reveals Christ in you. It reveals that you are experiencing victory after victory saying that the law and the promise of Jesus are not at opposite purposes, but that they work in harmony with each other. Since God gave them both, and he doesn't work against himself, the law was to reveal man's sinfulness and his desperate need for a savior, which would be freely offered exactly. in the promise. And for this next section that we're going to look at, I want you to just picture the three angels' message. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath law and believes in Jesus goes to heaven. For if a law had... Hold on a minute. Hold on. Everyone, the three angels message, everyone who keeps the Sabbath law and believes in Jesus goes to heaven. Well, don't we read in Romans chapter 4? In Romans chapter 4, verse, three, verse 4 and 5, it says, Now to him who works... His wages are not counted as a grace, but as a debt. But for him who does not work, but believes on him, but believes on him who is able to justify the ungodly, his faith 
is accounted to him as righteousness. So that saving faith, that trust in God and in the work of Christ transforms you. So you're going to want to keep the law of God because you love the Lord and you want to stay within the boundaries of the relationship. Just like if you love your wife, you're not going to want to cheat on her. You're not going to want to violate that relationship. The law of God is a law of love. We'll see that soon. Been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. Adventists don't say that righteousness is based on the law. We don't say that salvation is by the law, but we do say that Christ kept the law. And if Christ is in you, then the character of Christ, his lawful character, the righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh. Now, some people say that fulfilled means you don't have to do it anymore. So then you could be lawless. That would contradict what we read in Romans 8 and verse 7. For the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to his law. In other words, those who are in, are in the flesh are lawless. If you're in the flesh, you're lawless. If you're in Christ, if you're in the spirit, you are going to keep the law. Not you in your own strength, but Christ in you. You're surrendering to the character of Christ. Adventists don't teach that you're saved by the law keeping in your own flesh. We don't teach that you're saved by the law. We teach that when Christ is in you, when you've surrendered to Christ, then the character of Christ, which is a lawful character, is going to be revealed in your life. You will have victory over sin. Because Romans chapter 6 and verse number 15 and 16 says, what shall we say then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. For do you not know that to whom you present yourself as slaves who obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. So you're not going to go on sinning because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. So if you're under grace, you're in the spirit. If you're in the spirit, Romans 8, 4, righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled in us. So this is not what Adventism teaches. Wow. That's wow is right. contrary to the three angels' message. So <laughs> no, the three angels' message is not teaching that you're saved by keeping the law in your own strength. So again, this, this is a deception from Satan, what we're seeing here. It's undermining the law of God. This actually leads to lawlessness. If you can say, well, we don't have to keep one of the Ten Commandments, one of the Ten Commandments don't matter anymore, you just destroyed your basis for having any problem with the immorality in the world today. You can't speak against those who are practicing immoral lifestyles. I mean, we're to love the sinner, but hate the sin, but I'm talking about the sins. You can't speak against those sins. You can't speak about the standards of society falling apart. You just undermine the law. You undermine the one commandment that says, remember, this is the work of Satan. What a deception this is. He's saying if the law could have provided righteousness and eternal life, there would be no gracious promise. And we know the promise is faith in Christ. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin. So and that's what it is to be under the law, Romans 6, 14. But it says, but sin shall no longer have dominion over you because you're not under the law, but under grace. You're in the spirit. You're going to keep the law, Romans 3 and verse 31, Romans 8 and verse 4. Going right back, the same things over and over. And Revelation 14, 12. This is the patience of the saints. These are those who keep the commandments of God. So that the promise and have the faith, faith of Christ. in Jesus Christ. And the, faith in, and the faith in Christ is trust in Christ. To those who believe. And the Greek word for shut up here means to enclose on all sides, like a fish trapped in a net, a sinner trapped in sin. That's that all people are sinners. And yeah, but you see, this is, this is providing grounds for a defeated gospel. Because if you can't keep the law, if, if Christ in you, if you're not allowing Christ in you to give you victory after victory, then you're given a defeated gospel. You're just talking about you're just going to be in sin and there's nothing you can do about it. 
as you can see, this is just so contrary to the false teaching that the law of God is the seal of God on our heart. Next, And I've just showed you it's not contrary because the Holy Spirit seals us with the character of Christ, which is a lawful character. Uh, and so, like it says in Philippians 4.13, I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me, including keep the law, and incl including enjoying the Sabbath. What a joy the Sabbath is. Verse, verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. So he's saying that only saving faith in Jesus is what unlocks the prison door where the law keeps people bound, and he relates this to a jailer. We were kept in custody. The law acted like a jailer to condemn sinners on death row who are awaiting God's judgment. But Yeah, the law reveals we're all sinners. It absolutely does. And you can't keep it in your own flesh. Only Christ could keep it. And Christ in you, the hope of glory, you experience victory after victory. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, does this man believe it's okay to commit adultery? Does it okay now to, uh, to fornicate, to worship idols? Uh, you just can't have any victory, right? Well, it's interesting because you'll see it only comes down to one law. He's saying that the faith later to be revealed, that's faith in Christ alone, that releases people from the bondage of the law. That's the Mosaic law or the law written on the hearts of Gentiles, according to Romans 2, 14 through 16. Next. And also when we see in Hebrews, uh, if we go to Hebrews, uh, let's see, Hebrews 8 and verse 10 says, For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. You see that? Uh, what is this referring to here? What is he talking about here? Well, Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel, of which we become part of as we are grafted in, Romans chapter 11, uh, 17 onward. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be their people. What law did Jeremiah, this is the Old Testament, what law did Jeremiah have in, in mind? Of course, the law of God, of course, the moral law, of course, the Ten Commandments. Verse 24, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. And, the Greek and that's exactly what we teach in Adventism. That's exactly what we teach. We teach we are justified by faith. Okay? And so, therefore, you're justified by faith. You have peace with God through whom we have access to this grace in which we stand and we glorify God. Basically, what I'm thinking about Romans 5, 1 and 2. Yeah, that's what we teach in Adventism word for tutor here refers to a slave whose duty was to take care of a child until adulthood. The tutor escorted the children to and from school hmm. and watched over their behavior at home. And these tutors were usually super strict and they caused those under their care to yearn for the day when they would be free from their tutor's custody. The law was our tutor by showing us our sins and escorting us to Jesus. Next verse, but... The law shows us our sins. That's exactly what the Ten Commandments do. But we also see in the context of Galatians, he's also dealing with the ceremony. The ceremonial aspect is really brought into the picture. And I think that's what we really are getting into, especially when we talk about circumcision and these things. But nonetheless, nonetheless, yes, the law... As I mentioned, the ceremonial aspects points us to Christ. The moral law points us to our need for Christ because we don't have the power in our own flesh to keep the moral law. Now that faith has come, watch this. We are no longer under a tutor. Okay, under the law, right? 
Wow, it was he, he it like the music stops like that was oh we got you there. But as I mentioned, you're not under the law because you're not under sin. And so if you're under sin, you're a slave to sin. But if you're in the spirit, you, the law is spiritual, you're going to keep the law because the law is spiritual. So that again, Adventists don't teach salvation by the law. We teach salvation by grace through faith. But um, again, does this person say you you just can't, you don't worry about committing adultery. Don't worry about it. You can commit adultery now. It, you see, it's only going to come down to that one commandment. It's only going to come down to that one commandment. So he's saying that through faith in Jesus, believers have come of age as God's children and are no longer under the tutelage of the law. But we are still obliged to obey God's holy and unchanging righteous standards, which are now... Okay, so we just pick and choose what those standards are? In other words, it's nine of the Ten Commandments. ...given authority in the New Covenant. And we know that all moral laws from the Ten Commandments appear in the New Testament. Oh, so there's nothing moral about having time set aside for God. That's not moral. To, to, to say, look, life isn't all about work. Life isn't all about my job. You know, I need some time for perspective to focus on God. Nothing moral about that. Nothing more about the Sabbath. Some of them multiple times, but you know the what? Sabbath doesn't even appear once as a command. Isn't that interesting? You see that? It's, it's so much throughout the Old Testament. We see it throughout. It is in the New Testament as well. Paul kept the Sabbath as his custom was. But um, to say, well, you know, it wasn't... The, the Old Testament, it just, just wasn't enough. We, we need it. We, it was restated so many times. But we don't, we don't see it in the New Testament, so it doesn't count. Well, we do see it in the New Testament. We definitely do. Um, Jesus kept the Sabbath. Paul kept the Sabbath. Okay, I'll just do a quick, um, I'll just do a quick reference here in Acts. I wasn't really planning to get into this, but let's go to Acts chapter uh, 13, and let's go over here to verse number, uh, let's see here, Acts chapter 13. And let's go to 40. I wasn't really planning to do this. Okay, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them next Sabbath. Okay, let's see. Um, let's go back a little bit over here. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city, this is verse 44, Almost the whole city. So they were keeping the Sabbath. Very clear. It didn't need to be explained. They were keeping the Sabbath. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Obviously, Paul kept the Sabbath. Obviously, the church, they were keeping the Sabbath as well. This is just a little part of it. There's more to get involved in that. But th there it says, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them next Sabbath. So this was Gentiles were there. And they were there on the Sabbath. And it says, Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes uh, followed Paul and Barnabas, who was speaking to them and persuaded them to continue by the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. So we see that they were keeping the Sabbath uh, Paul is not breaking the Sabbath. Christ is, was not breaking the Sabbath. Christ was in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He said it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So he didn't, he didn't uh, legalize it the way that those false teachers were, but he was still keeping the Sabbath. Okay. Sabbath was made for man, man for the Sabbath. So um, again, to say that the Sabbath is not mentioned in the New Testament Let's let me hear that one more time. Laws from the Ten Commandments appear in the New Testament, some of them multiple times, but the Sabbath doesn't even appear once as a command in the entire New Testament. Since so, so the keeping of the Sabbath by Paul, the keeping of the Sabbath by Jesus, 
That's not enough. Jesus is not an example to us. Okay, so when Jesus says over here in the book of Matthew chapter 24, and again, I wasn't planning to get into this Sabbath in the New Testament study at this point, but when Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 24, uh, let's go over there. Matthew 24. And he's speaking here about the great tribulation that is to come. These are future events, okay, which would obviously happen after Jesus had risen from the dead, okay, and after Christianity had been firmly established. When he says here in verse number 20, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Clearly the Sabbath is still remaining. Okay, but let's continue. It was only a symbol or sign of the Mosaic Covenant. Okay, now when we see that the Sabbath was a sign, and he has over there Exodus 31, 13, okay? And circumcision was also a sign in the flesh, as we look in Genesis uh, 17 and uh, 11. 17, 11 mentions circumcision as a sign in the flesh, and here we have the Sabbath as a sign in Exodus 31, 13. And, uh, but when we go to the book of Romans chapter uh, 4 and verse number 11, it says, He received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had be while he was still yet uncircumcised. So the sign is also a seal. We see that. And so the Sabbath is a sign, and the Sabbath is a seal. It's a symbol. It's revealing the authority of God. And so here in Revelation chapter 7, it says in verse number 2, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on the foreheads. Later on in Revelation, chapter 14, and verse 1, we read over there, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And according to the Adventist commentary, it says over there, textual evidence attests the reading, his name and his father's name, his name and the name of his father. So we could see very clearly, and Jesus said in John 49, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And when we go to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, and let's look there and verse number, let's see, let's look here. And it says over here, and starting in verse 7, But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is a name which is above every name. So when we think about the name of Jesus and the name of God on the foreheads, and we see that that is the seal of God, that is referring to the character of God. We see that Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, John 14, 9. And so it's very clear that Christ kept the law, tempted in all points, yet without sin. And so clearly the keeping of the law reveals the character of Christ. And so the Sabbath is a sign and the Sabbath is a seal. It's a symbol it's revealing the authority of God. When you read the fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 28 through 11, it tells us, you know, um, in six, uh, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. For in six days God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in it, and, re and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, on the Sabbath day, you shall um, 
this is not good for an Adventist to not get this right. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In six days you shall labor and do all thy work. So six days, labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day, the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it you shall not do any work, neither thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger within thy gates. For in six days God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day, and therefore he blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That was pretty close, I think. But anyway, it, it's pretty much dealing with the whole of life in that commandment that says, remember, six days you labor, you do all your work, seventh day is a Sabbath. So it's the dealing with the whole of life. It's a commandment that's dealing with the whole of life. It's revealing the authority of God, God as creator, okay, in six days, you know, so it's it's telling us about the word of God. So many churches don't believe in a literal six day creation anymore. And so it's it's a commandment that's dealing with the authority of God. OK, but when the veneration was transferred from Sabbath to Sunday, when you look at the Sunday law of 321 of Constantine and in his apostolic letter, Gaius Domini, Pope Paul II, I think it's in the fourth, fourth, um, the fourth uh, um, segment. I don't know whether it was a chapter or the fourth section of that letter, Gaius Domini. Uh, Pope Paul II also reveals that it was the uh, in the fourth century that the the civil uh, rest was mandated for Sunday, so it was made into a rest day, um, and so the uh, Sunday veneration signified the authority of Rome and the authority of the papacy. And a wonderful book by Samuel Bakioki from Sabbath Sunday goes more into that. Uh, you have the Council of Laodicea, 363. That's also mentioned in the Catholic Catechism dealing with Sunday. Okay, that's a signal, that's a symbol of the, the veneration of Sunday. And the transference of the veneration from Sabbath to Sunday is really um, a mark of the authority of man, whereas the Sabbath is referring to the, the authority of God. But it's the only commandment that says remember, because it's been the easiest for so many Christians to forget. And just like we're seeing demonstrated here, it's being considered the least of the commandments by many Christians. They say, well, it's not a moral law and we can reason our way out of it. And, you know, it's not that important. So repeatedly, Christians have demonstrated that that law just isn't that important. It's just not that important. They're leaning on their own understanding, as we see in uh, 3, uh, verse 5 and 6 of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord God. Lean not on your own understanding. There, this is really the commandment that you don't necessarily rely on your reasoning. You just got to trust in the word of God. And that's, in a sense, I think maybe that's the lesson in that commandment. That's why I think God says, remember, because this is a commandment that you just got to trust the word of God with. And so it's not a commandment that necessarily a person will become apparent to a person's reason. Not necessarily. Okay. But, so we see in uh, Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I have came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but fulfilled. And we saw that kind of reminds us how the righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled in us. Obviously, it doesn't mean you're going to break the law and sin because it's done away with. No. And it's because Christ, ne it, it, Christ made it clear. I did not come to destroy but fulfill. And how did Christ fulfill it? He kept the law, kept it perfectly. And it says, For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth... Uh, pass away, not one jot or tittle, will by no means uh, pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, one of the least, and the Sabbath has been treated as the least, just as being demonstrated here. As I said, it will all come down to just one law. Because they're not talking about breaking adultery and breaking, uh, stealing and, um, you know, bearing false witness or murder or any of that. It just comes down to one law. But it says, For whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, the Sabbath has been treated as the least by so many Christians. So that does away with the false Adventist teaching about the mark of the beast being everyone who doesn't keep the law of God. So how does... Okay, well, he it did say the law of God, and the Bible does say, compare those who don't receive the mark of the beast. It also mentions that they keep the law of God. They keep the commandments of God. Does a person get sealed in, by the... In Roman, and in Revelation 14, 12, right after speaking about the mark of the beast earlier.
leaving the true gospel. But the signs of this seal are evident by a believer's life being habitually marked by the fruits of the Spirit. And we know that believers will... And the fruits of the Spirit are not contrary to the law of God. They're in accordance with the law of God. ...will demonstrate these in their lives. And so it's clear that the seal of God is not keeping the Ten Commandments, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the law was given by Moses... But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But you heard Mrs. Bachelor at the beginning of the clip refer to... And I think I already uh, addressed all that, so let's keep going. Revelation. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And so... This I'm gets interesting. This one too. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yes. And so we know that the SDA argument is, see, there it is. Jesus is referring to the Ten Commandments here, and it refers to them again in Revelation 14. So, we have to keep the Sabbath, since that's one of the Ten Commandments. Well, hold on. None of the original founders of the SDA sect had any formal education in any of the original biblical languages. And it shows. Their theology... Now, this is a stupid argument, with all due respect. So, you think that no Adventists have ever existed since then who knew the biblical languages. There's no scholars in Greek or Hebrew. I could read Greek. I could read Hebrew. I'm not great at it. I'm a novice, but I could read it. But in today's world, it's so easy to use tools like Bible Hub or lexicons and so forth. But let's li listen to this. This argument, you'll I'll show you very easily how this argument will fall apart. Is awful. The Greek word for commandment. Uh, let, it, let him say that again. Ten Commandments here, and it refers to them again in Revelation 14. So, we have to keep the Sabbath, since that's one of the Ten Commandments. Well, hold on. None of the original founders of the SDA sect had any formal education in any of the original biblical languages. And it shows. Their theology is awful. The Greek word for commandments in both of these passages is entelos, or entele, singular. And so, in both of these verses, the word is translated as teachings. So, hold on, hold on a minute there. Hold on. Where is it translated as teachings? Where is it translated as teachings? Certainly not translated as teachings in the King James or the New King James, or uh, I don't think any, uh, I'm not going to say there aren't other Bibles that teach it that way, but let's take a look in the Bible Hub itself. Let's go to the Bible Hub over here. Here's the word entele. This is the word used in Mark 7, 8. But let's hold on. Before I go there, let's go to... Uh, well, he mentioned, because we love that verse. Yes, we do. Let's go to um, John 14, 15, where the word is used again there. John 14, 15. Oh, wait a second. I made a mistake. I wanted to go on that in Bible Hub. Uh, let's go. John 14, 15. This video has been much longer than I wanted. I really didn't want to get this long in this video, but let's go here. Bible Hub. John 14. I knew this would happen, by the way, that I'd go on and on. But let's see. I've got to finish this. Ay, ay, ay. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Let's look. I'm in the Bible Hub. Let's look in the Greek in the Bible Hub here. And we'll see that that word there, as he said, is entole 1785. Now let's look at the definition there. And it's translated there as commandments. You see? Translated as commandments, not teachings. But let's take a look over there. And so I'm looking at Strong's Concordance, definition, an injunction, order, command, 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 an ordinance, injunction, command, law. This is not a Seventh-day Adventist tool. It's right there saying it's a command. It's a command. So if you have plural, commandments, okay? This is the Bible hub. Um, here we see in Mark 7, 8, and if we look 
at it. In the New International, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding to human traditions, and that is the word used over there. And so if we look back again in the Bible Hub, so you, you see how it is command uh, or commandments or commands. Uh, the commandment is there and or it's explained that way as the definition command commands. And so um, they give a number of references here where it's translated as commandments. Matthew 5.19 and the NAS and the KJV and the um, INT. What is the INT? Um, uh, interlinear Bible? King James Bible? So there we see a number of verses where it's translated as commandments. Um, uh, if we look in the parallel, um, let's see. If we go back and look in parallel, just, just kind of picking one random verse here, Mark 7, 8. And so in the New International Version, it's commands. New Living uh, Translation, um, God's Law. It says, uh, if you ignore God's law, English Standard Version, commandment. Uh, Berean Standard Bible, commandment. Uh, Berean Literal Bible, commandment. I mean, you could do a search here. So clearly, it's not simply what he's saying uh, translated as teaching. It's the teachings of Jesus. Okay. That's the word that John used in both instances here. And watch this. This word is not the Greek word that refers to the Ten Commandments. Oh, well, I forgot. Again, I got my lexicon right over here. And I'm looking up entele right there. And it says, uh, commandment. Of the old law commandment, precept, ordinance. So again, uh, decree, edict. So very clearly, it's commandments. It's referring to the commandments. Um, so when we look in Romans uh, 13.9, Thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not murder, thou shall not uh, kill, thou shall not steal, thou shall not... Uh, bear false witness, and then it says, and then it says, um, and any other commandment, and that's the word entele. So it just mentioned the, uh, it just mentioned these laws of the Ten Commandments, and it referred to them as entele, entele. Um, when we go to Mark ten nineteen, Mark ten nineteen, that one. So Mark 10, 19 reads um, in the New King James, since I'm using that one, it says, Do you not know the commandments? You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. It says commandments, right? This is Mark 10, 19. And so in the Greek, what's, what's the word used? Same word, entelos. So I think that settles the argument that this is wrong what this fellow is saying. Mark 10, 19 did it. Sorry it took so long to get to that. But really, so we see that the individual commandments can be referred to as entelus. I think that takes care of that section. Let's continue. What was the teaching of Jesus? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so I'm just going to tear this apart. So, like I said, Romans 13, 8 and 9. Okay, oh, no man anything but to love one another, for love fulfills the law. For the law, right, and it mentions, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not uh, murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, are summed up, basically, and other, any other uh, command is summed up in this commandment, in this saying, namely, love your neighbor as yourself. That is what Jesus refers to as being the second great commandment, right? So when we go to Matthew, uh, when we go to Matthew um, 22, and we check out there, 
Um, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Matthew 22, 36. And then verse 37, when we read there, um, uh, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he goes on and to verse number 38, and he says, uh, this is the greatest, right? This is the greatest. This is the first. This is the first and great commandment. Then when he goes to verse number 39, or we go to verse number 39, Matthew 22, 39, uh, it says, and the second, the second, this is two. So the second, he says, is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the second one, as we see in Romans chapter 13 and verse 9, the second one, love your neighbor as yourself, summarizes the last five commandments. So if the last five commandments are summed up, by the second, then what does the first sum up? Obviously, the first five commandments. So that shows us that the commandments, all ten commandments, still stand. They still matter. So Jesus is basically summing them up and saying, love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul is saying in Romans 13:9, it sums up the last five commandments. So obviously the first great commandment, because that was the second, the first one summarizes the first five, which includes the Sabbath. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So Jesus is saying the entire... So what Paul is saying, again, taking the second, he's saying, well, the, the law, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. These are all summed up. These last five commandments specifically named, specifically named, are summed up in the second great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, and therefore the first great commandment, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, would summarize the first five. So you're not going to break the last five if you keep that second great principle, love your neighbor as yourself, and you're not going to break the first five if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Higher law is fulfilled in love. And we know that with the Sabbath, there's nothing loving or moral about taking a day off work. Well, there is something loving and moral about having a date with your wife, isn't it? If you don't give any time for your wife, is there enough, is, you don't give no time to her. Is that anything loving about it? Well, it's a time with God. You have a date with God every week. You give him the day. You give him the time. Okay, that is moral. That is absolutely moral. You don't make any time for God. You, you, all those first five commandments all work together. Even honor your father and mother. How do you honor your father and mother? Just doing whatever they tell you to do? What if they're atheists? What if they're devil worshippers? You honor them by doing whatever they tell you to do? No, you honor them by honoring God. So that's the first five. And that also explains why it's excluded from the New Testament as a command. It's not excluded from the New Testament. There's nowhere in the New Testament says the one that says, remember, don't do anymore. Okay, clearly it matters. Clearly Jesus points to it after his resurrection, as I pointed out in Matthew 24. Clearly Paul kept the Sabbath, Jesus kept the Sabbath. The Sabbath was kept by the early church. Man, since as Christians, we are now under a new law, which is the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is the law of love. A new commandment I give you, and there's that same Greek word for teaching. So again, we're talking about the law of love. What about love for God? You don't spend any, you don't give God a day? That's loving? You don't want to give him a day? Oh, my brother, this is really a messed up message. But isn't it interesting? It all came down to that one commandment. It all came down to that one that they consider least important. And what did Jesus say? If you teach somebody to break even one of the least of these commandments, if you teach them to do that, well, clearly, this is what's going on here. That's what's happening here. Um, you, you love someone, you don't spend time with them. You don't spend time meditating on their word. It was a day of rest. It was established before there was an Israel, before there was an Abraham, all the way at creation. That you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So Christians are under the law of love. That's how others in the world know we're Christians. Not by the Sabbath. 
the sun. Not by the Sabbath. Not by getting together and and show and, and celebrating and worshiping and praising God and meditating on His Word and having a holy convocation. That doesn't show anybody. When they see you all go to to church and you take that day seriously, that doesn't teach anything. Is that really that you make time for the Lord doesn't teach anything? about love and, and dedication to God, that a person might be willing to lose their job and livelihood because they want to keep the Sabbath, that doesn't show anything about love for God? ...and of the Old Covenant. So, as you can see, this false Adventist teaching is a different gospel. It's a gospel of righteousness. It's the true gospel. It's the true gospel. And that's not what you're hearing here. This is teaching people to undermine what they consider one of the least of the commandments, and that's just like undermining all of them. This is basically teaching you a lawless gospel. Even though they're focusing on, on the one commandment that says, remember, they're not focusing on the other nine. They're undermining the law just by focusing on that one, the one that says, remember, that God specifically gave to us. ...coming by the law, since they teach that the law written on the heart is the seal of God, instead of the Holy Spirit, who is God himself, and we it's know not that either or. only... It's not either or. ...receives the Holy Spirit from believing in Jesus alone for salvation. False Adventist gospel makes the law the seal, which thereby only brings condemnation to the people who are caught up in this cult. So, as you can see, this is a damning, cursed, false legalistic gospel that Adventism teaches. So, so you see this satanic work, this man, now he may be a nice guy, he might not know any better, I don't know. He spent a lot of time, really, with the Word of God and really misrepresents the Word of God, misrepresents the gospel. I can't weigh the motives of his heart. But clearly, this is an attack like so many others, like whether Miles Kettleson and answering Adventism. There's so much nonsense out there. And you need to study your Bible, and you need to understand that there is not a contradiction between the lawful character of Christ in the lives of believers, between keeping a day holy, which God said to keep, taking it seriously, rather than following the traditions of man. There's nowhere in the New Testament that Sunday is established. That's, that's nowhere in the New Testament that the veneration of the Sabbath was transferred to Sunday. That's nowhere in the New Testament. But the Sabbath is throughout the Bible, and the Old and the New Testament are not contradicting one another. They work together. So Adventists receive the whole of Scripture, okay? And that's very important to understand that. So if you're an Adventist, I just advise you to get out of this false religion. It's not Christian. It's a counterfeit from the devil. So, you know, when you say things like that, it's a counterfeit from the devil. Well, now you've opened the, the door for me to say what you're presenting here is a counterfeit from the devil. And undermining the law of God and attacking the law of God also undermines the gospel. Well, this was a lot longer than I wanted it to be, uh, but hopefully it was a blessing to you.